Welcome to The Great Awakening. I'm your host, Josh Dawes. Today on the show, I am joined by Pastor Chris Bolt to discuss a new docuseries on Amazon Prime called Shiny Happy People. The docuseries is about the Duggar family, who were reality TV stars on TLC for many years. Before that, the uh, show was canceled amidst a um, bunch of uh, revelations about ab- abuse in the family and um, with their oldest son. And um, the, the docuseries is about uh, much more than the family, though. It's about the teaching that, this, uh, that the Duggars um, adhered to, that they, they lived their life by teachings of a man named Bill Gothard and his Institute of Basic Life Principles. Um, docuseries goes into extraordinary detail, um, you know, exposing what, you know, I believe is a cult um, that is really teaching things that are not biblical and uh, creating really abusive um, environments and homes. Um, the docuseries uh, includes uh, interviews from one of the daughters of the family who I just exposed them really terrible things, but um, the creators of the show, you know, obviously have a bit more of an agenda. They try to kind of expand the critique to um, sweep up um, just regular conservative Christians, anyone who is, you know, Christians who are engaged in political activity or, um, you know, homeschooling or uh, any sort of um, traditional biblical roles. Uh, So I wanted to have uh, Chris on to talk about um, the actual, he's done a lot of work um, investigating Bill Gothard and another group that is uh, closely related, the um, Michael and Debbie Pearl. And so I wanted to have him on to talk about that. Um, so, I, you know, I think there's a um, there's a danger in um, conservative Christian circles as the world gets worse and worse. And we want to react, react to that. We can want to kind of pull away and find a way to protect our families from that. A lot of these these cults that are based in authority and, uh, you know, protecting the family, um, a lot of them uh, can be really appealing. And so as as we are um, you know, legitimately concerned about what's happening in the world, I think it's important to also kind of uh, sound a warning for, um, you know, a lot of these uh, these groups that can um, present themselves as alternatives, but are not actually biblical. Uh, they don't have biblical teaching and they are uh, actually in, in their worst instances, um, very cult-like. So, um, you know, I had Chris on to talk about that. So it's a bit of a heavy ep- episode, um, maybe not the best to listen with kids around, but uh, I think it's a very important conversation. So let's jump right into that conversation with Chris. Hey, Chris, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me on, Josh. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. Better than I deserve, as they say. Yeah. Uh, I'll credit to Dave Ramsey for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a, that is a, well, never mind. I won't say that. It is a boomerang yeah. say. I guess I did say it. <laughs> um, so I wanted to have you on. Uh, there is a docuseries on Prime right now that has been uh, generating a lot of uh, um, conversation, I guess, on on Twitter and and elsewhere. Um, it's a, it's called uh, I think Shiny Happy People. About um, really starts by looking at the the Duggar family, which was a, a reality show on TLC. Uh, <clears throat> I think started as Nineteen Kids and Counting, and they they kept counting, and <laughs> I'm not sure where they ended up, but they, they had um, quite a few. Um, but it really looks at the, their kind of uh, belief system and one of the, you know, the kind of organization that they were uh, tied to, uh, the Institute and Basic Life Principles, led by a man named mm-hmm. Bill Gothard. Um, yeah, the docuseries is uh, really kind of revealing. Uh, it, it's definitely concerning. There was definitely um, some crazy stuff going on in that. Uh, and you're, you've done some work kind of researching that. And, um, and so I wanted to have you on to kind of talk through like, what is that? Um, what is IBLP and why is it uh, something that Christians should be concerned about? Yeah. Um, you know, 
when a when a documentary or a docu series comes out like this, you know, it happens roughly every Easter or Christmas. There's some sort of thing about, oh, let's look at the real Jesus and was he married or not, and did he really raise from the dead? And there's always some sort of silly attack on Christians, right? And so there have been films like this in some senses in the past, like Jesus Camp or uh, you know other other such documentaries. And I, th- I think the immediate reaction of and I'm going to say theologically conservative Christians specifically, but uh, but the immediate reaction of Christians is uh, to to be repulsed by that and say, oh, all they're doing is painting us in a bad light. They're they're uh, attacking, let's say, uh, homesteading or homeschooling or, uh, you know, young earth creationism and trying to pick on the most crazy figures, the fringe figures in, you know, so-called Christian circles and then take them out as a way of showing that all Christians are like this, you know, political involvement is often uh, demonstrated in these uh, documentaries as though that's some sort of inherently bad thing as though, uh, you know, unbelieving leftists are any different. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that that's actually projection in a way, right? You've got unbelieving leftists uh, who politics is their religion. And so they're going to take political involvement and, focus in on that and be infatuated with that and then project that out onto these crazy right-wing Christians, you know, evangelicals who are trying to take over the world. Um, Everybody's doing that in a sense with politics, right? They're trying to use political power to put their morality out there, their worldview out there. There's nothing inherently wrong about that. It's a a question of who has the right principles or not on those things. But, um, you know, we can talk about that a little bit if, if, if you want, but I think that setting those issues aside, and we can we can talk about those, but setting those issues aside, there are some real problems uh, in some of the systems that were highlighted in this docu-series. Um, and I do believe it's cultish and uh, heretical, even. And uh, it, it's not as though this is just fringe Christianity. This is an inherently bad system. Jesus talks about a good tree producing good fruit, a bad tree producing bad fruit. You know the tree by its fruit. This is bad fruit, and it's a bad tree. It's not Christian. It's not representative of Christianity. What Bill Gothard has done, what Michael and Debbie Pearl have done, and uh, even Vision Forum, uh, in many ways, is a public uh, face of these uh, teachings, false teachings, that um, Reformed and fundamentalist circles in Christianity are particularly susceptible to because, as we'll see, Lord willing, uh, these systems use the same language but mean different things by it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that because um, the last thing I want to do is just use this as a springboard to, um, you know, jump on you know fundy Christians to our right that you know they're they're weird so they're bad and and that uh, you know I watched the the docu series earlier this week and. There is definitely an aspect to that, um, you know, tying different things together that aren't necessarily connected. You know, like you said, um, political engagement, um, you know, Teen Pact is something that I participated in as, as a kid. And it's just, you know, it's model you in for conservative Christians. You know, it's nothing unusual um, that, the you know even secular or leftist, uh, do in different ways. Um, but you know, it's, they're tying it to this other set of beliefs, this other, you know, uh, organization that is really problematic. So let's, uh, let's unpack that. Let's start with like, who is Bill Gothard? Yeah, Bill Gothard. Um, you know, he's often considered just a fundamentalist Christian, but I don't think that fundamentalist Christianity, uh, needs Bill Gothard. You know, I I uh, I love my independent fundamentalist Baptist brothers and sisters. In fact, I I married one, um, but she did not come up under Bill Gothard's teachings, uh, nor did she have to. Uh, it, the two are not necessarily connected, and and likewise, Bill Gothard's teachings are actually inconsistent with a fundamentalist view of Scripture and what it teaches in relation to things like the priesthood of believers. Um, and, and there are lots of other teachings besides. But Bill Gothard uh, never had children, and he never married. He is, I believe, 88 years old. He was uh, he ran into some trouble, I don't know, 30 years ago or something, uh, with in, in relation to some of the things he had been doing and whatnot with the Institute, uh, the, the IBLP that you mentioned, and ATI, which are really just different acronyms for really some of the same sort of stuff. 
Um, but uh, he he was um, accused by over 30 women of uh, impropriety in various forms, uh, but sexually predominantly. And uh, <clears throat> they they were going to take him to court. There were some statute of limitations issues. There were some issues because Gothard's system uh, has spread across the world. And so, for example, one of the uh, alleged victims was in New Zealand. And so they were unable to proceed with that. And he responded, as I understand it, by trying to do a gag order of sorts to keep these women silent about the things that he had done. Uh, but thankfully, I believe they won that. And so what I think is happening, first of all, I do believe that God uh, is behind some of these things that are being brought to uh, light right now. It's also the case that Gothard is old. And so he's not going to be around for a, a lot longer. And I don't mean that ugly, but he's not. Um, that means that a lot of this, even though I think functionally it's already passed on to others, and I think that's one of the things the docuseries is trying to say and pin it on the Duggars, um, you know, there's they're going to be it's going to be a movement looking for new leadership. And so this is a prime time to put some pressure on the system and bring these things out. You know, it it it's consistent with some of the things we're seeing out in the public sphere, too, regarding abuse. Uh, you know, the Southern Baptist Convention obviously is dealing with a lot of issues uh, very soon here at their upcoming Southern Baptist Convention uh, regarding uh, abuse and regarding um, the roles of men and women uh, and, and what the, you know, how men and women relate to one another in the kingdom of Christ, in the church and that sort of thing, even in the home. Things which Gothard's system focuses in upon uh, a great deal. So I just, I think that this is a good time to address such things. Uh, I do believe that God is behind it. Um, but also uh, with the legal recourse kind of being taken away, uh, the next step in the process is going full steam ahead in the public relations category in podcasts and interviews and books. And so you've got um, Ginger Duggar Buolo, She's come out with her book uh, exposing a lot of the false teachings and the consequences, like yeah. earthly, physical, mental, psychological consequences of those harmful teachings here on earth. And by no means is she a leftist. By no means is she a pagan or an unbeliever. She is a conservative Christian married to, I believe Jeremy's a pastor, and mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, in John MacArthur's realm even. Uh, but her book came out, obviously, then this docuseries has come out. I believe Jill Duggar is going to come out with a book uh, later on next year. And so I don't know. I don't I don't have some great insight into the background of all those things. But I know that these sorts of things are not merely coincidences. Uh, and so there's probably some planning going on. But it's it's time to address these things. I will say for my sake, I have recently run into uh, some of the false teachings of Michael and Debbie Pearl. And uh, the docuseries actually does address them. And unfortunately, there's nowhere near as much about them out there. Uh, it's usually focused in upon Bill Gothard. Um, but yeah, so. Yeah, uh, Ginger's book is phenomenal. I highly encourage everyone to go out and, and get that. It's, you know, there's such a, almost an epidemic of deconstruction. Um, mm -hmm. People who grew up in you know, kind of evangelical um, households and they're embarrassed about some of the stuff their parents, you know, <laughs> taught them and, in, in, uh, you know, purity culture and things like that. Um, but her, her book offers a really, uh, I think, healthy alternative that she calls disentangling, yes. where she's, she's, you know, her, her and her husband kind of went through all of this teaching, held it up to scripture and began to, you know, disentangle all of this, this bad teaching from, you know, what was actually biblical that she, she was taught growing up. So can you, can you walk us through what some of the, the, you know, problematic teaching is um, that comes from yeah. Um, IBLP? Yeah. And there's so much here, you know, it, uh, my, my area, you know, I've got a doctorate in uh, Christian philosophy, world religions and systematic theology. And so my area of study is it, it's apologetics. It's dealing with these false worldviews and whatnot. And, you know, theological thinking is systematic. What you adjust in one area is going to affect something way over on the other side of the system. Um, and and bad theology is bad. It it actually harms people. 
uh, not just in a spiritual sense, but even in a physical, mental, emotional, psychological way. And that's especially the case with cults. Cults are all about power and control. And, um, you know, you were just now talking about the distinction between what's now been called deconstruction, which is really just a repackaging of theological liberalism, by the way, uh, for our <laughs> modern day. It's, it's hotter, right, with the millennials. Um, you know, they're borrowing that word from Derrida and, and other deconstructionists in the literary realm and the philosophical realm, but uh, that doesn't surprise me. But uh, the deconstructionists in pointing out problems with these systems can show us a negative transcendental critique, I'm going to use that big phrase, uh, of a false and faulty system of thinking that doesn't mean that we agree with them. Right. And so what Ginger's doing is really quite brilliant. I'm glad that she wrote that book because, as you said, she's disentangling. Now, the funny thing with cults is, you know, there, there were those who were called deprogrammers uh, who back in the day would actually go into these cults and kidnap people out of them, essentially put them into these houses or apartments for weeks and not let them go. And then they would deprogram them. The problem with deprogramming somebody is that you have to reprogram them with something else. In the case of something like the Gothardites or the teachings of Michael and Debbie Pearl, which rely heavily upon conditioning, and Pearl himself uses that term. He believes in conditioning a child from the time they are infants all the way up, just like you would condition a horse or a mule or a dog. He says it explicitly in all of his material. Uh, he sees no distinction between raising a child and raising a beast. And there are theological reasons behind that that maybe we can get into. Uh, in a moment. But uh, my, my point there is it's so strong. There's such a strong psychological hold there that you have to reprogram folks if you're going to bring them out of this. Uh, you know, some of those who are in the system, when they realize there are problems, they have to figure out how to do that. And they're largely alone because of deconstructionists and radical left wing feminists and others who come out of the system and they're saying, I'm not that. I don't want to be that. I don't want to completely reject my faith, but this is what I've been taught is the faith, and I don't know what to do. And so it is absolutely wearying in that sense for these young individuals, in particular women, because they have been taught that they're under their father's authority um, indefinitely. Even after they're married, there's a large role that in-laws or uh, parents play in a couple's marriage and in how they raise their own children. And that's how this thing is perpetuated throughout the generations. It works almost like fire squads in the Marines. These are not, you know, there's a very insightful line in that docu-series, and I'm going to try to quote it from memory. Uh, and I don't remember the name of the individual who said it, but he said, you know, Bill Gothard made it so that uh, every father becomes a cult leader and every household becomes an island. That is spot on. That's extremely insightful. There's another woman in the documentary, and again, please forgive me for not remembering the names off the top of my head right now, but she mentioned that when you're in this system, you, you self-analyze, and you, she doesn't use this term, but you navel gaze. You're constantly worried about what am I doing right or wrong, and it's things that are not even moral things anyway, right? Like, mm -hmm. what do I there? What kind of painting do I hang up and that sort of thing? Uh, now, I know there's an argument to be made there aesthetically and ethically and all that, but we're not talking about that. Bill Gothard had some of this, has some of the strangest teachings concerning, you know, demonic presences in um, just objects, which you don't find that in the Bible. It's not there. Mm -hmm. and yet He convinces these folks that that's the case. And then when they run, it's almost a prosperity gospel. When they run into problems in their life, they must be doing something wrong, even if what they're doing is right and good. It's so overwhelmed by a legalism that constantly makes you navel gaze and check yourself and you're, you're, you're analyzing yourself psychologically. And what the, the woman in the film says is, you know, you're so focused on that that you never stop to question, wait a minute, are the things that I'm being taught even right to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're going to look at deprogramming people who are in the system, what would you reprogram them to? Well, you don't want to brainwash them into following another human or earthly authority. The only answer that there is out there for this cult is the word of God through the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I mean, Milton Rokich, uh, who's quoted in Walter Martin's Kingdom of the Cults book, a book that I would highly recommend 
so that people can understand how language in particular works in cults. They use the same terms, but read in a different meaning. For example, biblical patriarchy. There's nothing biblical about Bill Gothard's biblical patriarchy. It's actually a total rejection of what the Bible teaches concerning men and women in the home, in the church, in the social sphere. Uh, and we can get into that more specifically if you want. I'm, I'm ready to stand behind that claim. But uh, Rokic talks about um, different regions of belief systems that are recognized by psychologists. And so there are three questions that I've paraphrased. The, the first one is, is the world a threatening place or accepting place? Well, Gothard's system, Debbie and Michael Pearl's system, um, they're going to paint the world as a threatening uh, an unaccepting place. All men are predatorial, they're rapists, they're murderers. It's a dangerous world out there if you're outside of our system, which terrifies people on the inside, whether that be young women in particular, whether that be men who now react with an overprotectionism, whether that be with parents who now, I mean, we're talking overprotection to the utmost keeping mm -hmm. people in the system, in the household indefinitely. The second question is, whose authority should we accept? Well, of course, Gothard, Michael Pearl, they're, talk, they're spoken of in these systems. When you talk to survivors of these systems, they say, you know what? He was treated like a god. Everybody talked about them like they're god, and they're not giving God's word. It's their own man-made system. When you read um, Michael and Debbie Pearl, um, they say all sorts of things that are not, um, you know, there's how to train up a child book by them. Uh, they say all sorts of things that are not biblical at all. There, there are hardly any verses there, and the verses they do use are twisted. Um, but then the third question is, what is the structure of living in relation to those two answers? And that's where the control aspect of this comes in. That's where the spiritual abuse aspect of this comes in. And by that, I mean something like this. It's taking God's word, or taking something adjacent, allegedly, to God's word, and then using that thing to harm another person, intentionally or unintentionally, to benefit oneself. It truly is, and I'm going to sound like a leftist here, but it truly is about power and control. This is Genesis 3. It is the narcissist wanting to be like God, and even believing they are God. And this applies in particular to fathers, to husbands who are out of control, who are not under God's authority. They have set themselves up in the position of God. Yeah. And one of the, one of the things that um, they talk about in the documentary is um, just this, this teaching, his teaching of authority. Of, it's like an umbrella that mm -hmm. the, the father protects his family from you know, whatever, you know, evil is out there in the world. And if you step out from under that authority, then you deserve whatever is coming to you. So it's, it's, it's very legalistic um, way of controlling people. And Ginger talks about in her book how she would, you know, if anything bad happened, she would instantly racking her brain. Did I do this? Did I, you know, is this something that I have um, brought on myself? Am I, am I disobeying my father in some way? Mm -hmm. And that, that is, it's very you know, scary. Like, I, I think that is a great way of describing it. It turns every family into a, a little cult mm -hmm. and the, the father is the head of that cult. And um, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's something that, you know, I, I've got a personal uh, history with Gothard and, and his teachings and that my, my dad was a pastor um, when I was younger and we had a church that was really heavily influenced by Gothard and his teachings. We've been, I've been to the IBLP, you know, conferences way back in the day when they used to sell out entire arenas. And um, thankfully my parents um, pretty quickly saw through um, just how legalistic this was, that this was adding laws um, to God's word, you know, that, that if you have to keep these laws in order to remain in good favor with God. So it was a, it was a lot of work to, really kind of help disciple people out of this in that church. And, you know, a lot of them, uh, as much as they speak of authority, they don't, they don't, you know, see any sort of role for ecclesiastical or, uh, you know, church authority. Uh, they're, they're very, uh, were some of the most contentious church members uh, my dad ever had to deal with. 
and they um you know were quick to uh, to leave once uh, that the authority of Gothard was was challenged but um yeah what is um what is the why do you think this this teaching is so appealing to Christians I think one of the reasons why is uh, simply because fundamentalists and reformed believers in particular are uh, they're thinkers, right? And they want to do what's right. And they're, they take their faith seriously. They're very nuanced about it. Uh, again, uh, doctrinal concern, all of which are good things. Um, and when you read the Bible, uh, you know, I, I, I have no shame in what I believe the Bible teaches. I, I do believe that God is God, that he's a God of justice, that he's a God of wrath. But I also believe that God is a God of mercy and compassion and love and grace. And those things are not at odds with one another. Um, you know, I do believe that the Bible teaches that a husband is to love his wife as Christ loves loved the church and gave himself up for her, that, that wives are to submit to their husbands. Scripture teaches that. I believe that children are to obey their parents. I believe that we're to be in submission to the governing authorities in the civil realm. Uh, scripture teaches those things. It teaches church authority uh, in Matthew chapter 18. Uh, but what Gothard's system does is it takes that language. And by the way, when I say this, uh, this is one of the strengths of, of that cult system, is that you don't merely have Gothard as the authority figure. You have a decentralized system where there are various households who follow his teachings to greater or lesser extent. And that makes it more difficult to address, right? It's not like you can go uh, after uh, Muhammad's teachings per se, because every household is going to follow these to greater or lesser extent, and they may be hearing and reading it in different ways. The same thing with Michael and Debbie Pearl. Uh, you know, Michael and Debbie Pearl started this thing called the Shindig. So there are these Shindigs that are set up all over the country where people go, and they essentially are doing arranged marriages. Now, hmm. that's... I'm not going to comment too much about what I think about that or don't think about that. But the point is that uh, there, there are decentralized structures there in play, and those families and those groups use these teachings to greater or lesser extent. So it's very easy for them to respond and say, well, that's not what we believe or that's not what we teach, which, by the way, can be a form of spiritual gaslighting when they say something and then go back on what they've said, even though it's plainly there, it's double speak, right? It's double mm -hmm. thinking um, or whatever the word is. But, uh, oh, what was I going to say? So when people hear biblical patriarchy and they are very conservative Christians, they may go, well, yeah, um, you know, every family under heaven is named for the father. That's in Ephesians. And, uh, you know, Russ Moore talks about that in his 2006 uh, Jets article. But anyway, uh, when you go and look at the teaching of Gothard on this, though, he's not talking about a biblical patriarchy. You read Vody Balkum in his book, What He Must Be. In that book, he talks about the father as the priest of the home and the prophet of the home. But if you read him carefully, he stops there. The priest of the home simply means that, that fathers, that husbands, should pray for their family. And, and being the prophet, did I say priest there? It means prayer. Prophet, as prophet, the father should teach his family, washing them in the water of the word. Those are explicitly scriptural categories. But what Gothard does is he puts Christ as this authority, and underneath Christ, directly underneath him, is the father and husband as mediator. Well, the Bible teaches that there's one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. We're told in Scripture that we are a, a royal priesthood, right? And so there is a teaching. It's a Reformation principle. There's a priesthood of believers. Everyone who believes in Jesus Christ, who trusts in him, has direct access to God the Father through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to go through your husband. You don't have to go through your father. Do you see the distinction there? Even though the mm -hmm. language sounds very similar and you go, amen, that's right. The father's the head of the home. The, the husband's the head of the wife. Uh, no, that's not what Gothard and those following his teachings are saying. There is a hierarchy there in an unbiblical sense of Christ, then dad, 
and then mom, and then the children who are called manager, managers of the home, which simply means that they do all the work, <laughs> uh, which, which increases the stress, the anxiety, and all of those sorts of things of following the system. I want to point out, too, that in the Westminster uh, Catechism, you know, there is a question. I don't have it up in front of me right now. Well, maybe I do. Um, let me see if I can find it real quick here. But there is a question in the Westminster Catechism that pertains to this very issue. You know, even though there are clearly authorities in our lives, and the Bible teaches that plainly, that doesn't it does not follow that everything those authorities say uh, is legitimate, right? And so here it is, question 130. What are the sins of superiors? The sins of superiors are, besides the neglect of the duties required of them, an inordinate seeking of themselves, their own glory, ease, profit, or pleasure, commanding things unlawful, or not in the power of inferiors to perform, counseling, encouraging, or favoring them in that which is evil, dissuading, discouraging, or discountenancing uh, them in that which is good, correcting them unduly, careless exposing or leaving them to wrong temptation and danger, provoking them to wrath, or in any way dishonoring themselves or lessening their authority by an unjust, indiscreet, rigorous, or remiss behavior. Just because someone is in a position of authority does not mean that that authority operates in an absolute unchecked way. All earthly authorities, whether we're talking about the civil magistrate, whether we're talking about church government, whether we're talking about family government, fathers and husbands, those are derivative authorities. God is the ultimate authority. And so what you find, for example, in the Gothardite movement, as well as with the pearls, you find a lot of people who are in the so-called house church movement. Now, I don't have any, you know, principled objection to if you want to meet in the house and you have a church government and you practice the sacraments, great, and the preaching and teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it's really interesting to me that often those go together. Why is that? Because then you're not under the authority, biblically speaking, of a church. Mm -hmm. And then you're more readily uh, rejecting what the civil government does. Now, you and I know there are clearly problems with what the civil government is doing even right now in our country. But, um, you know, it does. It creates this island. And the ultimate authority in that system is this narcissistic husband or father. And it, it just feeds the flesh. You put in this legalistic system, there is no grace, there is no out for those who are under it. And the language that's used um, is, is appealing to those who are conservative Christians on the outside. And so these things, as an overreaction, are more readily accepted, particularly in the context we find ourselves in right now. Yeah. Well, it, you look to, I mean, I think this is where the, the documentary or the, the, the TV show, the reality show was such um, probably a gateway drug for some people. You look, yeah. and, and this was the thing I remember growing up, you know, you look on the outside, you go to these I, B, BLP and they are, they, they have this really groomed, happy, shiny people <laughs> exterior that all of the kids, you know, they stand in a line, they smile, they're so well behaved. And you look at your home and it's, my home is nothing like that. <laughs> you right. know, the kids will not listen. They don't pick up. I've told them a million times. And someone comes along offering this system that brings order, that brings easy answers to all of your behavior problems. It's really appealing. Um, you know, Michael Foster talks, uh, has been talking a lot um, lately about how young men will come to him and want answers for things. And his ans you know, his answer has become like, you need to develop wisdom. That's what wisdom is. You can't, I can't just give you the answer. You've got to, you know, figure it out and apply wisdom to your situation. And, and so many of these systems are designed to kind of short circuit that here's all the answers. You just have to buy into this, <laughs> this horrible, yeah. um, you know, cult ideology to, to attain, obtain it. Yeah. And it's interesting. You hit on the, the perfectionism, the judgmentalism, um, you know, we hear this term Pharisee thrown around, right? Like if you're a young earth creationist or you believe in biblical, uh, I'll, I'll say complementarianism just for the sake of argument, 
Uh, if you believe in, uh, cons- you know, the, the virgin birth or the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins in our place and our right standing before God through faith in him, you know, you believe in these sorts of things and, and you believe that there's an actual moral right and wrong, that there is truth and falsehood, that there is good or, or there's beauty and there is ugliness in this world. Uh, and then you apply that outside of yourself. People will come at you and say, well, you're a Pharisee and Jesus spoke against the Pharisees. No, that's not what's happening there. Right. And so we often as conservative theological Christians want to reject that type of uh, reactionary thing from leftists and unbelievers and rightly so. But there really is a Jesus who pronounced woes upon the Pharisees. And when you read the Bible, the New Testament, that's what Jesus is doing. And uh, it's evil. It's deeply evil because these people have the truth and they take it and they twist it. They take everything that's good and twist it against other people. And Jesus does have a heart for those who are being wronged under that system. You know, Josh Duggar was able to cover grievous sin and crime on national television. And there's that entire facade. And it's not as though there's this happy, shiny people or whatever, and a little bit of spiritual abuse sprinkled on top. The the facade is part of the spiritually abusive system. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it work. Uh, Michael and Debbie Pearl, a lot of times people want to uh, you know, defend their book, just run of the mill Christians, they want to say, Oh, well, I believe in spanking. Or, well, you know, it's okay. I, I understand people get angry sometimes when they discipline their kids or whatever. That's not what their system is teaching. Yeah. Their let's system- go into them. What are what are they and how are they connected? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh in the docuseries, there's there's a point there with the it, it mentions the pearls and it puts Michael Pearl on there. And it's a, I believe they show the clip from the Anderson Cooper interview with him, where he says, there's no distinction between raising children and raising a horse. Uh, He actually believes that. And there's a theological reason that he believes that he believes that the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and this appears in his book to train up a child. He believes that the tree of knowledge of good and evil is put in the midst of the garden and that God tempts Adam and Eve as the first like exemplary parents or whatever tempts Adam and Eve with the good and the evil. And Adam and Eve did not have a moral consciousness at that point. Now, I would recommend Gerhardus Voss and his view on that tree, by the way. It is a a, a probationary tree. There's nothing special about the tree. It's a real historical tree, but it does stand for the principle of probation. So Adam and Eve, no good through not eating of the tree obeying the word of God itself upon its own say-so. Only God has that right to tell us to obey based on his say-so. Parents and fathers don't have that right. Um, Civil governments don't have that right. But our first parents, Adam and Eve, were to obey God. and, And in that, they would know the good in distinction from the evil, which is disobeying God. Because they partook of the tree, the world is plunged into sin and death, the curse falls upon it, all of that. Now, Adam and Eve know evil uh, experientially, right, in relation to the good. So they know good or evil either way with the tree. Uh, But with Michael Pearl, what he's saying is that's placed there, and it's this type of principle that he then recapitulates with regard to every individual child. And so he denies the doctrine of original sin, as cults do. (laughs) <laughs> and so in denying the doctrine of original sin, he believes that a child does not have a moral consciousness until between the age of 12 and 20. He says that traditionally it's the age 12. Now, in Jewish law, that was the age. And then, I mean, in those who comment upon Scripture, if you read John Calvin, you read John Gill, they mention this. But he says, biblically, he thinks it's closer to the age of 20. So if you come out of one of these households and you're, say, 22, these parents are thinking of you as being like two years old in terms of your moral consciousness. Hmm. So if there's no moral consciousness with a child and they don't know the difference between right and wrong until they're between 12 and 20 years old, how do you maintain that child? How do you train up that child in the way they should go? 
And he draws this sharp, unbiblical distinction between training up a child in the way he shall go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it based on the proverb. He distinguishes sharply between training, which is used there and it doesn't have a lot of theology to it elsewhere in scripture. He distinguishes between that and discipline. Discipline is when a child acts up in particular in public and brings shame upon the parents. See, there's your ph Phariseeism. It's, it's not that he's concerned about the child knowing God. Mm. It's that he's worried about what he looks like to others. And so, again, go read Matthew 23, the way that Jesus sharply rebukes the Pharisees. They do all of these things on the outside, but inside they're full of rot. Pearl explicitly states that his system is not just for Christians. It works with non-Christians, too. It's not about raising up godly children. He says this. It's about raising up well-behaved and good-looking children. So if they have no moral consciousness, what to what do you appeal? Well, you use conditioning, and he uses that word explicitly. It is conditioning. You train up the child as you would train up a beast. This means not applying some sort of punishment when they misbehave or reward when they do well. That's biblical discipline in a Christian system. What he says to do based on his system is to tempt the child as Adam and Eve were tempted, just like God, you see, mm -hmm. tempt the child with something good, with something that matches up to their natural inborn desires like beasts have, and then apply the stimuli. Now, he won't call it punishment, but that's what it is. You apply the stimuli. You spank the baby during blanket training. Now, I know there are misinterpretations of that and different way that pe ways that people uh, apply that. But, but the point is, when you look at the overall system, there's an adversarial relationship between parents and children, and you treat them as beasts, as animals, in training them the way that you would train a mule, a horse. I mean, he explicitly says these things. He tells a story about an Amish man who had a 12-month-old boy sitting on his lap. And the 12-month-old boy tries to get off his father's lap to go across the room to his mother. And the father picks him up and, and spanks him. And then the child reaches out for his mother across the room. His mother looks, puts her head down and looks away. And the father disciplines the child, as it were, in that sense. Again, he does this for 45 minutes. Mm. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with a 12-month-old boy wanting to go to his mother. That's a good and natural desire. But Pearl says this Amish man knew what he was doing and it was impressive. And this is the way he had broken and trained, you know, broken the will of and trained mules, you know. And mm. so what this does to the moral consciousness of a child, I mean, I, I've, I've heard stories from survivors out of this system who were desiring suicide without knowing what suicide was, but they were desiring suicide as early as age six. And it's because of this type of emotional and psychological mental burden. You know, a lot of people who go into cults, they, they choose it. But imagine being raised up in this system where it's applied to this level and it serves the self-serving desires of the parents to look good and pleasing to men on the outside rather than obeying the authority of God in disciplining biblically and raising up their children to know the gospel. By the way, Pearl says that the parents play the role of the Holy Spirit in this. Well, you can't play the role of the Holy Spirit. I don't care how good of a parent you are and how closely you follow the word of God. Your children are going to go astray. You know what you do? You pray for them because you're not the Holy Spirit. God is, right? Mm -hmm. And so and I'm not, don't uh, read into that too much, uh, Trinitarians following this. I'm a Trinitarian, but, but the Holy Spirit is God and it's his job to do that, right? Well, how does this apply to the gospel? Well, Pearl says, that guilt burdens children, even though they have no moral conscience, even though they're beasts until they come to that period of their lives where they have to make their own tree of the knowledge of good and evil choice. And he says, inevitably, they'll choose wrongly. And that's where biblical discipline comes in or whatever. And they have a moral conscience. But he says they don't understand the gospel. If they don't have a moral conscience, they can't sin. And so they certainly don't have a need for the gospel, but they do have a need for something to atone for their guilt. And so what you have to do is you drive that guilt out of them. The atonement is the belt or the mm. paddle or the plumbing pipe or whatever. 
And so you're standing in not only for the Holy Spirit in this system as a parent, you're standing in for Christ until that child is old enough to understand that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and took away our guilt, objectively speaking. And so you see the subtlety here. You know, what is it, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who said that discernment is not the difference, is not knowing the difference between right and wrong, but the difference between almost right and and, and wrong, right? So Mm -hmm. that's what you see in this type of cult system, but they're using the same language. You, You cannot, and Tim Challies has some good book reviews on this, by the way, I would encourage people to look that up as well as his uh, critique of Debbie Pearl's book as well about wives. You know, in that she walks that line uh, with regard to women who are being abused, physically abused by their husbands. And she says, well, this is like Christ did. You know, he was abused and he didn't deserve it. So, you know, it's Mm. I I mean, I, I make that by the way, somebody pointed out to me, you talk about these things and you laugh sometimes. It's because it's so absurdly ridiculous and evil. Uh, I'm not saying that's the right response, but that sometimes if you don't laugh, you cry because people take these things seriously. That's one more comment I want to make on the doctor there, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll let you move it the way you want to go. But, uh, you know, there's a scene in the docuseries where this man calls this young boy up there and then demonstrates spanking in front of the entire audience and then like, hugs him afterward, tells him to come in again for a hug. It's super creepy for anybody with half a brain. Um, But what I want to note is how humor is used in this system. People are laughing and he's making it seem like it's a joke. And what that does is it provides the cover to usher in these actually seriously psychologically, there I go again, psychologically harmful things that are placed upon these people. Um, the same thing with the scene with uh, Jim Bob and Josh Duggar when he's talking about that, uh, you know, whatever it is, this, the, the sex thing that he's supposed to be teaching his son. And he's making these jokes about it. But they actually believe those things. It's a very serious conversation for them. But but they can mask it with that humor for people outside. Michael and Debbie Pearl do the same thing constantly. You know, he makes a joke about like, you know, a child, like a two year old, three year old, whatever in the store. He says he was sitting upright in the shopping cart like a little terrorist, you know, and you laugh at that. You're like, yeah, there are times where I thought my children were acting like terrorists, but they actually believe these things. And when you look at the cumulative effect of it throughout the book, he's making it so that parents are adversarial in an adversarial relationship to their children. So there you go. Yeah. It, it, one woman in the, the docuseries um, was in, I mean, she describes just a horrific marriage where her husband i I guess Mm -hmm. believed in wife spanking is that something that they actually teach so i don't know that michael and debbie pearl uh explicitly teach that or bill gothard but yeah what you do have in this system let's go back to the umbrella of protection thing you you have oh the father's the priest the father's the prophet and so he is like the new christ through whom the children and the wife need to go not only are they outside of God's protection, supposedly, if they step out from the Father's protection, but they're also, um, they have to make confession of their sins to their husband or to their father. Mm. Again, this is on a spectrum, and so different households do different things. So I don't want people listening to this go, well, we follow some of these teachings, and that's not what we believe. Okay, but I'm telling you that there are people out there who definitely do believe this, and... um what that does, though, is it makes it so that you don't have your own personal thoughts and you think that's a regular or normal thing. You know, my wife, I promise you, does not come and confess her sins to me unless they're against me or unless she wants help in, you know, fighting temptation or something. And I would do the same thing with her. That's not an authority structure or something. Uh, but she doesn't have to confess her sins to me. And when she, you know, she comes out from under me or so, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is, There is an independence in the Lord apart from husband or father. And so when you look at wife spanking, and that is a real thing that's out there. I had a pastor friend, I was telling him about some of these things and some of the things that I've recently encountered. And he said, that's crazy you say that because we had some of these families kind of infiltrating our church. And at first it seemed like they believed the same things we believed. They did the same, you know, they had the same lifestyles. They were homeschoolers, homesteaders. I keep referencing homesteading because that's a way to keep the family kind of in. 
They're not out in the work sphere. Um, but he said, but then we found out that they believe in wife spanking. I was like, okay. And, and believed in keeping the oldest daughter at home. Now, when you look at families that are larger families, and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way, uh, that's between you and the Lord. If you've got a pastor or somebody who wants to tell you to have X number of children, watch out. Uh, you know, the, the biblical authority is one thing, but when people want to control every aspect of your lives and it's not explicitly spelled out in scripture, you're in a cult or you're headed that way. So watch out. Um, but, but all of this goes with that umbrella of authority, that protectionism, that false belief that explicitly, really, or implicitly denies the priesthood of the believer. Um, there is a freedom in Christ. That's a freedom in the Lord. That's an independence in the Lord. Um, back in Genesis, it talks about the, um, for this reason, a son will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. There's no timing that's mentioned in that, but these folks will take that passage of scripture and say, well, obviously if a young man needs to stay at home until he's married, how much more does a daughter need to stay at home until she's married? And so she remains under the father's authority. Um, that is false. In 1 Corinthians 7, which is another text they want to use on this, uh, the Apostle Paul writes, and he, he says that the uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 33, I'm going to start, or 34 rather, I'm going to start at the end of that verse. The unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord. That's very important. The unmarried woman is concerned about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman, is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. So it's not father's authority versus husband's authority. It is independence in the Lord and submitting to one's husband in the Lord. Same thing with children, by the way. Children obey your parents in the Lord. When you go back and you read, by the way, there's debate about whether or not this is even referring to fathers and their daughters. It could be referring to people who are betrothed. I'm not going to get into that right now. The point is, even if you take the harder reading, that Vision Forum, that Bill Gothard, that Michael and Debbie Pearl and their followers might take, uh, even if you take that harder reading, you go back to a commentator like John Calvin or John, Kill, or John Gill, not John Kill, but John Gill, uh, they take that reading and they're very quick to say repeatedly, this means that the father has no authority. This means that the father no longer has any power. When the father, verse 36 of 1 Corinthians 7, if anyone thinks that he's not behaving properly or he's behaving uncomely, the KJV says, toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong and, it's, and it has to be, let him do as he wishes, let them marry, it is no sin, or let her marry, it is no sin. What does that mean by behaving uncomely toward one's virgin or daughter, if you're taking that reading? John Gill says that means you're keeping her at home when she should be married. If the young man's pursuing her and she wants to be married too, you let them marry. They're not sinning in that. They need to marry. So now talking to the narcissist father, look, <laughs> you've had 18 years, let's say. I know that's in some senses, ethically, biblically speaking, that's a somewhat arbitrary number. Depending upon your state you live in, it's tied to the law. You got to draw the line somewhere, okay? But let's say it's 18. You've had 18 years to discipline this child, to train her up in the way that she should go, and when she's old, she will not depart from it. You don't get extra credit time. You're concerned about yourself at that point and the way you look. This is very important, in particular for those who are stuck in this system, because there's the constant worry about dishonoring dad. Even when a woman's in her late 30s and married with children, she's still concerned about dishonoring her dad. First of all, you're not doing anything illegal by coming out of that. Second of all, you're not doing anything immoral by coming out of that. But what bothers people a lot of times is that they feel as though they're dishonoring their parents. And I believe in honoring our parents, even when they're old in age and we're outside of the house. But the way you honor your parents, if they raised you in the admonition of the Lord, the discipline and instruction of the Lord, the way you honor your parents 
is by following Jesus Christ is by submitting to God and his authority, is by training up your children in the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. That's how you honor your parents, not by following their every whim and way. They don't have any business or right to be up in your business. They have no moral or biblical or or God-honoring authority over you. That is a control issue. That's narcissism. Break out of it. And you are doing the right thing in that. And you have no reason to worry about it if indeed the way you were raised is biblical. And they have no reason to be a control freak if the way they raised you is biblical. The problem is Gothard's system and the Pearl system is not biblical. And so they're worried about what they look like. They're worried about their control, and they're worried about extending it into other generations against God. Mm. That's why they act the way they do. And so now go read the Duggars, uh, uh, Volo's book. Read some of the things that she talks about. You know, a lot of this is relational, by the way. And folks who come out of this system have great difficulties building relationships. And Ginger goes into this, and it breaks my heart. Because you come out of a system like this, and now you're not sure how you relate to other men and women who are in Christ Jesus. Because everything you knew was this isolated little family thing under this authority structure. It's a fire squad type cult following Gothard of the Pearls. What do you do? And so you start to get close to people. And then if you get too close to people in a way that those on the outside think, that's that's strange that they're getting kind of close that way. It's criticized, and now you're right, you default back into the cult teachings. Mm. And if you don't get close to people, then you're completely alone and isolated. And Ginger talks about that. Thankfully, she had Jeremy there. When she came out of the system, she married this guy, right? And so in social settings, if she was with her family on the show, she was fine. If she's with her husband when she comes out, she's fine. She, She mentions this in her book. But if she was alone, she was struggling. How do I relate to people, you know? And so um, I would encourage those listeners who have come out of this system or are trying to get out now, just understand that whatever it is you see in that earthly person you've trusted in, understand that there are other people out there in the world you can trust as well. And you know well enough what it is to have your trust completely violated when you discover the wrong things that have been done to you perhaps your entire life as a child, but um, you'll have that discernment when it's needed, but trust people as you trust God and he'll take care of you. Yeah. And hold, hold on to Jesus. Don't, don't let the abuse that you legitimately went through cause you to turn your back on Jesus and the gospel. It is, um, it's, it doesn't have to be that way. It's not that way in healthy churches. Uh, Find a good church. Um, What would, what would you uh, you know, last question, I know we're running a bit long. What what advice would you have for pastors who see, um, recognize some of this influence coming into their churches, or maybe, you know, they saw the documentary and realized, oh, dang, I've, <laughs> we've had uh, a lot of these ideas um, in our church for a while. Yeah, you're not going to deprogram folks with social um convention. You have to rely wholly on the word of Christ. That's the only thing, you know, know, uh, survivors out of this system, they will have good views of the word of God. They'll have it tucked away in their heart. They'll have the Holy Spirit if they've indeed trusted in Jesus Christ, and they will have a good work ethic, and they'll have a good understanding of authority if they have those things, it's despite the system, not because of it. Don't think that the cult beliefs are the icing on the top. The things that are communicated in the church sphere, in the public sphere, that sound like what you believe in, those are the facade to hide the spiritually abusive system underneath of false teachings. Uh, the, the, the system is the false teaching. And so I would say have a spine because it's going to take actual leadership to address the issue. So you better be ready. 
because there's going to be a fight. Uh, Have grace and compassion and patience toward those coming out of it. And do not be tempted to cast more moral legalistic restrictions on those people coming out because that is what they have lived under their entire lives. And that will merely further their abuse. Don't do that. Point them toward freedom in Christ. Point them toward the grace that's found in Jesus Christ. Encourage them in the word of God and encourage them to rely upon the Holy Spirit that they belong to Jesus Christ and no one else and that they will always have God with them even when they feel alone. Um, But I would just uh, encourage you to be on your guard against this, especially as it is a type of overreaction, it's very appealing right now in relation to some of the things that we do see in the world that is the mm-hmm. absolute destruction of the family. But be on your guard against this because this is grossly unbiblical and it is not the solution to that. The word of God and the word of God alone and what God has commanded is the solution to it. Small details tell big stories. If you see the red flag, you better start digging. Yeah. And if you see crimes, report them to the Absolutely. authorities. Yes. Do not think this is something that you can deal with under the church, you know, governance right. or, or whatever. This is, there's crimes, get the authorities involved. And um, I, I, I know countless times, by the way, I know, I know you want to, we need to draw this close, but there are countless times I've seen with this system where the parents will walk right up to the line of what is criminal or not. It, it, is, it is very, very good at training people to do that. I think that's actually mentioned in the documentary, and I have found on a personal level that that is true. Mm. Well, this has been a heavy episode. I think it's uh, important. I think, you know, the temptation is to, to look away and dismiss these sort of critiques as, you know, just another attack on right-wing Christians. But uh, I appreciate you, you speaking to this and... Um, you know, helping uh, our audience recognize this and understand what um, what is that you know at stake in these uh, these sort of systems, um, so that we don't on. yeah, so that we don't leave people with the you know heavy black pill. Uh, what's something <laughs> that's giving you hope right now? Whew, thank you. That's a good question. What's giving me hope is that we are called in Jesus Christ, and He has a purpose and a plan for us as long as we're this side of heaven and he will use us and he is our protection. He is our shield. He is our refuge, our strength, and uh, he will guide us. He will lead us. He gives us wisdom when we lack it, when we ask for it. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. I love it. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate you. Appreciate you, Josh. Thank you for what you're doing. That's our show for today. Big thanks to Pastor Chris Bolt for joining me for this conversation. Chris is not currently on Twitter, although he has been in the past. So if you know Chris, uh, send him a message. Tell him to get back on Twitter because I think he's always got interesting takes on things. Uh, Chris is a local church pastor in Tennessee. He has a heart for apologetics and for uh, helping Christians develop sound doctrine. And I I really appreciate uh, the work that he does. Uh, He does have a book that I will have a link uh, in the show notes to, as well as um, links to some of the resources he mentioned in our conversation. If you found this uh, episode helpful, please send it to a friend. I think this is uh, an important discussion that um, is worth uh, worth having with people as especially as the world uh, becomes more and more hostile uh, to the things of God and a scarier place to raise your kids in. I think a lot of these authority cults are going to become more appealing to people who are not as grounded biblically. So I think it, it's good to, you know, kind of be aware of the, some of the dangers in that direction as well, and not just from the left. So, um, yeah, definitely share this and, um, you know, step into those conversations as, uh, as they are relevant in your life. If you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and hit like and subscribe so you don't miss future content. If you're listening Ratings and reviews at Apple Podcasts are always helpful. Till next time, I will talk to you soon.